My dear students, welcome. We are discussing multiple choice questions on pharmacology. And we will discuss some 10 questions on this particular session. So let's start. Chromoline sodium. And there is just a colon. And it's trying to describe what does chromoline sodium do. Okay, chromoline sodium. A. Stimulates the beta 2 receptors. B. Prevents antigen antibody reaction. C. Inhibits degranulation of mast cell. D. Inhibits bronchial hyperreactivity. And E. Dilates the bronchus. So, what has been done simply is the mechanism of action of various drugs which are used in asthma, they have been put in the as the five options. And you are asked to choose what does chromoline sodium do. If you straightway remember it, you come to the answer. So your classification should be good. How to classify, how to remember this drug is from what class. And if no, we go on to analyze the options. Stimulate the beta 2 receptors. It is a beta 2 stimulant. So is chromoline an adrenergic drug? Is it an adrenergic agonist? Obviously not. It could be epinephrine, isoprenaline, salbutamol, etc. There is no chromoline sodium in this. Prevents antigen antibody reaction. Can it go and prevent the antigen antibody reaction on the mast cell? The reaction of the IgE antibody on the surface of the mast cell with the antigen? Obviously, no, it can't do it. Chromoline sodium inhibits degranulation of mast cell. Is it sounding right? Yes, that's the answer. Chromoline sodium goes there. It doesn't do anything to the antigen antibody reaction. It doesn't prevent binding of the antibody to the antigen, doesn't prevent the reaction. Reaction happens. But when the reaction happens, the mast cell is going to degranulate and is going to release various chemical mediators of asthma, including say histamine, leukotrienes, bradykinin, etc. So this degranulation is inhibited, the mast cell membrane is stabilized, and therefore you can prevent the further events which are which are happening. So most important thing is it is useful for prevention. Because you see, when the antibody is combining with the antigen, reaction is happening, mast cell is being broken, that time the drug should be there. The drug should be there before that. And therefore, chromoline is useful for preventing an attack. Once the reaction has happened and the mast cell has degranulated, chromoline has no place. Please remember, chromoline cannot be used to treat acute breathlessness. It has to be there before that. So it is useful only for prevention. Next option is inhibits bronchial hyperreactivity or hyperresponsiveness. Can you remember whose is this action? This mechanism is belong to corticosteroids and this is why corticosteroids are useful in asthma to decrease the hyperreactivity. Last option is dilates the bronchus. So is chromoline a bronchodilator? Obviously not. Bronchodilators could be the beta 2 stimulants or it could be muscarinic blockers in the form of ipratropium, tiotropium, etc. So, the answer is chromoline inhibits the degranulation of mast cells. You understood it? Yes. Let's go to the next question. Next question. Which of the following has atropine like effects? Morphine, pentazosin, pethidine, methadone, and fentanyl. What is all this? All these drugs are narcotics, they are all opioid drugs. And the question is which opioid drug has got atropine like effect? Atropine like effect means muscarinic blocking effect. So it's going to lead to antispasmodic action. It's going to lead to dilation of pupil. And if you look at all the opioids shown here, morphine, pentazosin, methadone and fentanyl, there is only one opioid which is structurally related to atropine, although we classify it under the opioids and the name of the drug is pethidine. It does act on the opioid receptors, but it's got atropine like structure. So, pethidine has got atropine like actions. So, answer is pethidine. Next question. In presence of a competitive antagonist, the dose response curve of agonist. Oh, it's a question on general pharmacology. In the presence of competitive antagonist, the dose response curve of agonist gets shifted to the left in a parallel manner, shifts to the right but decreases in height, gets shifted to right in a parallel manner without change in height, does not change its position and becomes more steep. I think you have to address this issue of competitive antagonism and before 
getting confused with all the options which are long sentences is better to see what happens in competitive antagonism say it to yourself in your mind and then you will straight away come to the answer look at this i'll i'll try to draw it on the board so we are trying to draw the dose response curve and trying to show the competitive antagonism so the dose is on the x axis and the response is on y axis and first we shall draw the curve of an agonist suppose there is an agonist and the log dose response curve of an agonist is this so you have just given agonist and you got this particular curve what is competitive antagonism now what we have to see what hap what will happen if antagonist is already sitting on the same receptor so suppose you have added antagonist here you won't get any curve due to an antagonist and in presence of antagonist i add an agonist so for the first curve what i would like to write is agonist is that okay now i am trying to draw the second curve if the antagonist is occupying the receptor and if you add agonist the agonist obviously will not produce response because antagonist has blocked the receptor however in competitive antagonism if you gradually go on increasing the dose of the agonist at some stage the agonist is able to displace some small amount of antagonist and then you start getting a response so now when you have added an agonist in presence of antagonist you get a response but here you don't get any response you have to go give more and more dose and after a certain dose you are going to get a small response look at that this is the first stage when you just got a response you still go on adding the drug the agonist will displace more and more amount of antagonist and the more proportion of receptors will be available this is how this curve will go on increasing the height and slowly you start getting more and more responses are you appreciating it yes and if i want to complete this curve a stage is going to come when full antagonist is displaced and the agonist can produce what is called maximal response and now you will get the curve here so this is the curve of the agonist in presence of antagonist so ignore these blue curves in between just compare this one and this one what do you see what you are obviously seeing is the curve has got shifted to the right in a parallel manner and look at the height is able to achieve the same height is able to achieve the maximum response this is why we we call this antagonism as reversible antagonism you can fully reverse the effect of the antagonist so that's competitive antagonism and here i write agonist in presence agonist in presence of antagonist so i hope this will be uh, this will be an image in your mind permanently and then you can solve the question and let's go to the options curve get shifted to left in a parallel manner not possible shifted to right but decreases in height no height is the same get shifted to right in a parallel manner without change in the height yes we got the answer next does not change its position obviously wrong and becomes more steep there's no question of the slope which we discussed so i think you got the right answer the curve gets shifted to the right in a parallel manner without change in height so more dose is required so there is shift to the right but you can achieve the maximum height let's go to next question which of the following should not be used in a case of myocardial infarction which of the following should not be used in a case of myocardial infarction morphine buprenorphine pentazosin meperidine and low dose aspirin first let us take out this low dose aspirin it is used in myocardial infarction everyone knows it's an antiplatelet agent next agent you have meperidine pentazosin buprenorphine and morphine so many times we use a narcotic analgesic in a case of myocardial infarction to decrease the anxiety to produce sedation to produce the calming effect and for analgesia 
so morphine can be given buprenorphine can be given pethidine can be given but pethidine is not a very useful drug pethidine could be useful but it could stimulate the heart because it's got a troponin like effect and the option c pentazosin is the most vulnerable drug to produce tachycardia pentazosin has got an effect of stimulating the heart it increases the blood pressure it stimulates the heart rate so this tachycardia is going to worsen this condition so we go to the answer pentazosin increases heart rate and blood pressure contraindicated in a case of myocardial infarction please remember we go to the next question yeah acute intermittent porphyria is a contraindication for use of opioids benzodiazepines barbiturates non benzodiazepines and valproic acid this is a very simple question very straight forward question and most commonly asked question you need to remember because it is about barbiturates barbiturates are inducers of microsomal enzymes and this is the reason why they can precipitate an attack of acute intermittent porphyria so that's a very strong contraindication for the use of barbiturates go to your general anesthesia chapter and try to read through thiopentone sodium you will find it's written the contraindication is acute intermittent porphyria so i'm showing you the answer that's barbiturates next question question number 16 shortest acting competitive neuromuscular blocking agent is so the question is asking you to specify so many things it should be shortest acting it should be a muscle relaxant and it has to act by competitive mechanism means it has to block the nicotinic receptor the options are dantrolene mivacurium succinylcholine dutobacuranin and pancuronium obviously dutobacuranin pancuronium these are fairly long acting agents the first one dantrolene d for d is a directly acting agent so it is out next you have mivacurium and succinylcholine and i hope you can see the word choline in the name succinylcholine it will obviously tell you that it's a partial agonist of acetylcholine and it's a depolarizing agent it's not competitively blocking mivacurium is the shortest acting competitive neuromuscular blocking agent but please remember succinylcholine also has got short action we would have chosen it if mivacurium would not have been there on this options because the examiner wants a competitively blocking neuromuscular agent we are going for mivacurium otherwise succinylcholine also was an answer if they would just ask a short acting muscle relaxant let's go to the next question so answer is mivacurium here i'm taking you to the next question which of the following is a preferred general anesthetic agent in a known patient of epilepsy it means you want to give general anesthesia to your patient and if the patient is a known patient with epilepsy what to do and which drug is preferred the question is asked because many and many drugs many general anesthetic agents they can precipitate seizures this is their common adverse effect options nitrous oxide halothane enfluren isoflurane and ketamine always start remembering the drugs the drugs which are potent and long acting as halothane enfluren isoflurane and the thing will become easy this last drug isoflurane is a better drug as far as many other issues are concerned just as that isoflurane does not precipitate any seizures and it is supposed to be safe in a patient with epilepsy that's why the preferred general anesthetic for a patient having epilepsy is isoflurane so i show you the answer isoflurane we go to the next question which atropin substitute is useful in management of parkinsonism and the options are propanthylene trihexyphenidyl pirenzepin thiotropium and glycopyrrolate all are atropin substitutes let's analyze them one by one propanthylene methanthylene oxyphenonium bromide all these are antispasmodics next trihexyphenidyl crosses blood brain barrier and is useful in parkinson and that's called trihexyphenidyl that's the answer pirenzepin is a specific m1 blocker and it decreases the gastric hyperacidity thiotropium do you remember anything thiotropium ipratropium these are also atropin substitutes and they are useful in bronchial asthma by the route of inhalation last one is glycopyrrolate 
it's very typical it is an alternative to be used as pre anesthetic medication in place of atropine so it's a new pre anesthetic medication and it is replacing atropine very fast so the answer is try hexafenidyl this drug is very commonly used in the management of parkinson it's an atropine substitute and this drug is extremely useful also in drug induced parkinson disease next question for you which shall be useful to treat hypertension as well as prostatic hyperplasia and whenever you come to prostate you think about alpha blockers question is which shall be useful to treat hypertension as well as prostatic hyperplasia if the patient has these two associated conditions then which drug is going to be better i said you come to the discussion of alpha blockers and that's good look at the options labetalol terazosin tamsulosin prazosin fentolamine what is all this these are all alpha blockers labetalol is blocks alpha receptors in addition is a beta blocker so don't think about it now we are left with terazosin tamsulosin prazosin and fentolamine fentolamine is short acting you cannot think of giving it every day because this patient is suffering from hypertension you want to treat it on chronic basis no question of fentolamine fentol it is used by intravenous route of administration next we are left with terazosin tamsulosin and prazosin yes this is getting closer now prazosin is an anti hypertensive drug it is also used in heart failure sometimes but prazosin has no action on the prostate in the prostatic hyperplasia so you are left with two drugs terazosin and tamsulosin between these two drugs tamsulosin is useful only in prostatic hyperplasia it does not have a sufficient anti hypertensive effect in the peripheral blood vessel so the if the question would have been which is preferred for prostatic hyperplasia best would be tamsulosin and you get a drug which is in between here terazosin which is able to decrease the blood pressure which is also able to relieve the prostatic hyperplasia so the answer for this question is terazosin so i show you this answer terazosin question number 20 that's question number 10 on this particular session thiopentone has a short duration of action due to due to what thiopentone has short duration of action due to rapid destruction slower brain entry rapid elimination from the body rapid redistribution and renal breakdown i think this multiple choice question are going to be competitive is going to be challenging and is going to be useful to you look at that why short duration of action rapid destruction slow brain entry rapid elimination from the body rapid redistribution and renal breakdown if you start putting your head into it probably you can't come out there's a better way to do it what is thiopentone ask yourself thiopentone is a barbiturate it's an ultra short acting barbiturate where is it used you heard it in which chapter anesthesia what is it it's a general anesthetic by what route of administration intravenous it's a very important intravenous anesthetic thiopentone sodium do we use it use it for long surgeries like halothene and fluorine isoflurane etc no don't use it for long surgeries the name itself tells you ultra short acting barbiturate means it will be for short procedures and most importantly it will be for induction of anesthesia beginning of anesthesia which type of drug we will choose for beginning of anesthesia which will produces the action fast or which produces the action slow which produces the action fast rapidly you want this action to have a long action or short action obviously short action because you want to use it only for beginning of the anesthesia this is a speciality of intravenous anesthetic they cross the blood brain barrier very fast they go inside they get distributed in the cns and they act they produce the action and they immediately come out that's great this is called redistribution the drug crosses the blood brain barrier goes in the cns produces the action and rapidly comes out and this is why the action terminates very fast that's the reason why thiopentone becomes a short acting agent not only thiopentone for that matter two other intravenous anesthetics propofol and etomidate have got the same property 
rapid redistribution. Please remember this for the intravenous anesthetics. And I show you the answer that's rapid redistribution by the intravenous anesthetics. So this is how we have come to end of another session, another interesting session of multiple choice question. We shall meet on more sessions and discuss more pharmacology and I am sure that things are going to be slowly simpler and simpler for you. I wish you good luck.